This morning, just want to call your attention to, once again, the fact that between services, we have a ministry fair. You saw the hubbub out there and all the, the stations and the tables and the places where all of the ministries of Valley Bible Church are showing their ministry. So please take an opportunity after this service to go around and uh, talk to those folks. Uh, the purpose of this is that you are aware of all of the ministries of Valley Bible Church, but also uh, the church is a family, as we often talk about. It's a body, and uh, every family member has a responsibility. You have a responsibility, not just to come and worship and sing and praise God, but we all have a place. We are all gifted. You are all gifted in some way, unique and special to build up the body of Christ that is Valley Bible Church. And so I encourage you this morning to take some time to, to consider where God may have you serve. All right, with that, I would have you turn with me to the book of James, James chapter 1, and uh, we continue in this study of uh, trials in this portion. Um, before we do that, would you pray with me, please? Father, we have sung your praises this morning, for you are high and holy and exalted and lifted up. We thank you and praise you that you are a God in whom there is no darkness or shifting shadow. You are pure and undefiled in every way. You are infinite in all of your attributes. There is no limit absolutely to any of them. Your love is, is greater than anything we could ever imagine. Your power is beyond us. And you, for some reason, have chosen us to be your children. For that we're grateful because we recognize that in us there is no good thing that dwells and there is no merit in us. And so we're grateful that you and your kindness and your mercy have given to us your son, Jesus, and you have given to us this great salvation in which we stand. We pray that you would help us to grow in holiness, closer to your likeness and the likeness of your son. And would you use trials in our life and would you please use the word of God this morning to help us to understand and put in perspective the things that you are doing right now in every one of our lives. Speak to us now, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, and uh, we are going to read verses 9 through 12 this morning. Uh, just a short passage. Uh, the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our Lord stands forever. And to honor his word, would you please stand as we read it this morning? James chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, the word of God. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will fade away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Would you be seated, please? Money. Money, 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 right? Uh, they say love makes the world go around, but boy, money is a big part of it, isn't it? It's a big part of every one of our lives. Um, you can't live without it, and you can't live with it. It's kind of like, you know what I'm, it's kind of like, kind of like love, right? Uh, if you don't have enough money, life is tough, and there are trials that go with that. Two, if you have a lot of money, it's a trial as well. You may not think that if you don't have any money. You think, how could that be a trial? Because like it uh, like, uh, says in the book of Ecclesiastes, money is the answer to everything, right? When Solomon said that, he said it tongue-in-cheek because that's what people think, that money is the answer to everything. If I just won the lottery, if I just 
one, the publisher's clearinghouse. If I just had enough money saved up, if I just could pay off all, just. And we, we think that money will solve everything, and yet um, our culture, culture is replete with stories of people of great wealth who are miserable, who squander it, who end up with nothing in the end, and so money is certainly not the answer for everything. In fact, finances are a prime area for trials and temptations for both the poor and the rich. And that's what we are looking at in this passage we just read. Uh, it's a prime area of, of trials and, and temptation for the poor and the rich. Not just the poor, not just the rich, but for all believers. It is an area of trial. It is an area of temptation. Indeed, we are still continuing in this chapter, up through verse 18 in chapter 1, talking about trials. And uh, next time, we will kind of turn a corner where he, where James will talk about in trials are temptations to sin. And uh, we can understand that right now, and even in the, the message this morning, that when we face trials, there are trem- temptations to sin. Last week, we saw this, and we're go- we continue to see the same truth. When facing trials, we need, we need the right perspective, we, we need the right attitude, and we need the right response. We have to have an, uh, an attitude of joy. We have to have a perspective that God is working larger something in our life, both in the short term and in the large, long term. And our response is to be perseverance and faith. But God is using this, whatever trial you're going through right now in your life, to make you more like Jesus Christ. Consider it all joy. That's the attitude. And that continues in, this, in, this, in these verses today. This attitude of joy continues because he continues to talk about trials. But we have to have the right perspective, understanding uh, in an eternal way, and in a, a temporal way, what God is doing now and what God is doing in the future. And the re- response is always, the response of everything in the Christian life is faith, isn't it? We always are to trust in God no matter what is happening in our lives. So we're continuing the the same idea of trials, right perspective, right attitude, right response. So, when enduring trials, if you are poor, be glad of your riches in Christ. Are you poor? I don't know how many would say that they're poor this morning. Probably not many of us. But you may think that you are poor in relation to another person in this room, in this city, in this nation. But if you are struggling with finances, if you don't have enough, if there's some level of poverty in your life, be glad of your riches in Christ. He says in verse 9, But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. He's talking about believers here. Remember he said, Consider it all joy, my brethren. And here he continues, but the brother of humble circumstances in this context of consider joy, considering a joy, enduring, asking for wisdom, not being tossed here and fro. If you are a brother of humble circumstances, if you are a poor person, be glad of your riches in Christ. Now we need to define a few terms here and then we'll, uh, we'll understand what he's talking about. Um, he calls this brother, a brother of humble circumstances, Humble circumstances in the New American Standard is one word, and it just is the word for humility or humble. It's the common word that's used throughout the New Testament of someone who is humble. In fact, later on in James, he will say, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Same word here. So the person who is humble. And, and, but he's obviously not talking about a characteristic or a quality of humility here. He is, he is making a comparison between this man of humble circumstances and the rich man, because he says very literally in the next phrase, and the rich man. So the word humble can oftentimes be used of someone of a lowly position, a low estate, someone of few means, someone of low social status who's uh, indistinguished, they're of no account. Just like today, rich people have status, they have favor, etc. They have power, and people think well of them because they have a lot of money, so they're on TV and they're on, 
uh, in the movies and in popular culture, loves people who are rich. But the poor are ignored. They're of no account. Sometimes they're pitied. Oh, those poor people. Poor people that live over there. We feel sorry for them. Oh, they're so lowly. And that's what he's talking about. A person of, of low social position, which would include some level of poverty. So he, when he says the brother of humble circumstances, he's talking about a brother who has some level of poverty in his life. He's the poor brother. He's the one who doesn't have any money. But he says this brother is to glory in his high position. Glory is a word that means, it varies translated, whatever your, your translations have. Some say glory, some say take pride in, some say even boast. And that is really the, the essence of this word, to glory and to boast about his position. So this, this brother in Christ who doesn't have a lot of money is to boast and be proud of the fact that he has a high position in Christ. Now, isn't boasting something that is frowned upon in the scriptures? Pride, isn't that something? Isn't that the opposite of humility? He says, the brother of uh, humble circumstances who's humble, and he's supposed to take pride? And we know the pride is that original sin, and I, I believe that it is at the, the heart of every sin that comes into our lives. We become self-serving and self-centered, and here he's not talking about a pride that is self-serving and self-centered. There is a proper place for pride. Aren't you proud of your kids? I hope you are. You should be. Sometimes you're proud of, uh, of, of many things in life, an organization you belong to. You're proud of your, your church and Valley Bible Church and the family that we are and how we take care of each other. And that's something that we can honestly glory in, boast about, take pride in. But what is it that he takes pride in? He says his high position. This poverty-stricken, poor brother in Christ is to boast, to be glad. You see, the, the, the attitude of joy comes through here in glorying and boasting in his high position. What is the high position that James will be talking about? His position in Christ. When you come to Christ, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Look at Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. It says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you a believer in Christ? Where are you right now? According to this verse, you are seated with the Lord Jesus Christ far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every nation and kingdom and king and president and prime minister, you have that position with Christ. Not above the galaxies, but there is, a, uh, there is a place above the heavens of heavens, the abode of God. That's where your position is in Christ. You have that right now. That's who you are in Christ. And so you see this lowly person in, in the time of James, who probably ran away from persecution in Jerusalem, and maybe even uh, by becoming a, a, a Christian, by becoming a Christian, he gave up his inheritance. Maybe he was rich and he gave up his inheritance. And now he's poor and he's being persecuted financially. Or maybe it's a person born into poverty and they're so low and they've never had anything in their life. And now in Christ, they have everything. He says, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It, that is salvation, is a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. 
It's the same word that he says that James uses. Boast, take pride, glory, be glad in your high position. You can't boast in your good works, but you can boast in what Christ has done for you, right? Because it's all about what he has done. Romans 8, 15 and 16 say this, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Who is your Father? Christ, God in heaven is your Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. And we can call out to him as his children to our heavenly Father who loves us. In the Spirit himself, the Spirit himself rather, testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and therefore one family, brothers and sisters in Christ. If children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, trials, that we may also be glorified with him. In this life we have trials, we will be persecuted, we saw it last week, but right now, you are a child of God and you are an heir of Christ. What did Christ inherit by dying and rising from the dead and being seated on high? He inherited all of creation, all of the universe, all of the universe remade, will all be remade, heaven and earth remade, kingdom of God on, uh, on the earth, and all of that belongs to Christ and guess who else? You. It belongs to you child of God, by grace. We don't boast in ourselves, but we boast only in what Christ has done for us. Unfortunately, I think it's like, uh, I don't think that most Christians really live this way or understand this. Most Christians live like, well, I, I know that I'm going to heaven when I die, and that's something to look forward to. There's more to it than that. If that's where you're living, you're living in poverty. Yesterday, Tara and I went to um, a football game. We went to see Eastern Washington play Idaho State, and we, we bought the tickets online. I had the tickets. I um, printed them out. That's the way things are done nowadays, by the way. Anyway, uh, and I got thinking about this. Okay, it's not game day. And that's the way people look at salvation. I got a ticket. When game day comes around, I'll redeem my ticket. And I get to go to the big party and celebrate with my team. That's not salvation. It's not waiting for game day. Game day is today. You have all of those riches in Christ today. Live like it. Live like an heir of Christ. That doesn't mean you deserve a Cadillac or a BMW. That's not what this means. It means you have holiness and righteousness and the power of Christ to say no to sin and to live in righteousness because you have been given all that you need in Christ. It is yours today. It's not game day. It's not punching a ticket when your life is over. It's yours today. Galatians 6.14 says this, May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm dead to the world you should be dead to the world. But if we're going to boast in anything, it's in redemption. It's in what he has done for us. It's not what we can do for ourselves. So you know, when James says, oh, brother of humble circumstances, oh, brother who is poor and doesn't have any money, boast, be glad, take pride, glory in the fact that in Christ, you have gone from the lowest of lows to the highest of heights, and it is yours today. Not just tomorrow, but it's yours now. And that is something where we can rejoice in the midst of our trial. That's why we can endure. That's why we can endure with gladness and enjoy, and we can do so asking for wisdom because he is always there with us. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, great memory verse for you, says this. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, 
justice and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. That's our pursuit in life. That's what we boast in is our understanding and knowledge and relationship with the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the King of kings in heaven. And we are wrapped up in that relationship. And that is something to be glad in, to take pride in, to glory in, to boast in, to take great joy in. Even when we are enduring trials of poverty. So that's why we can maintain the right attitude of joy. And you say, well, but man, that doesn't pay the bills. Right? There may be some of you who say, oh, that's great. I'm encouraged by that. But boy, you don't understand my financial trials right now. Put a placeholder on that. We'll come back to that, okay? But we want to talk about the rich man for a moment here. In verses 10 and 11, we see that when enduring trials, if you are rich, be glad your wealth is worthless. Now, before I said, how many of you are poor? Probably not many of you would consider yourself poor. How many of you consider yourself rich? Hmm, okay. So this doesn't apply to any of us, does it? None of us are poor, none of us are rich, so let's talk about the other guy, those poor people out there. And then Donald Trump and those other people over there. This is who this is talking about, this part, right? If you are rich, be glad your wealth is worthless. Verses 10 and 11, he says, And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises... With the scorching wind and withers the grass and his flower falls off, the beauty of its appearance is destroyed, so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. The rich man, now we've got a contrast, we've got the poor man in verse 9, and we have the rich man in verses 10 and 11. The poor man is to take pride in his high position, and the rich man is to take pride in his low position his humiliation because like a flowering grass he will pass away pass away that's a, a euphemism we use when we say someone dies right they pass away that's what he's talking about you are going to pass away the rich man is going to pass away it's a euphemism for dying but this rich man is to glory take pride be glad in the fact that he has been humiliated, in a sense, his humiliation. What is the, this, the, this humiliation, this, this um, lowering? This is the opposite of, it's actually the same word that he used of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the poor man. He says, the poor man, the humble man, is to take pride in his riches in Christ, and the rich man is to take pride in his humility. His lowliness, his low estate. Talking about his salvation. We're talking about a brother here too. This is the one who thought that everyone thought was better than the poor man because in this culture, if you're rich, then you must be godly and righteous. A man of pride, a man of name, a man of circumstances, a man of means, position. And yet when this rich man comes to Christ... He says before God, it's, a, it's any salvation is, is humbling, isn't it? Every time, whether it's a rich or a poor person comes to Christ, we humble ourselves before God and we say, I have nothing. I have nothing to bring. I may own a cattle on a thousand hills. I may be a man of high position and degrees. I may be known by a lot of people and have a high name. I have, may have a lot of kids and a lot of... Uh, cattle and a lot of property, but when it comes to salvation, it is worthless. Everything that I own is of no account. Right? Everything that you have earned has been given to you. Every plaque you've got on the wall, all the things that you've earned and all the, the, the cert certifications, God doesn't look at any of that when we come to Christ. It is worthless. Now, Jesus 
Je rather, James is not condemning the wealthy here, per se, because Zacchaeus was wealthy, Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy, Abraham was wealthy, Job was wealthy, S Solomon was fabulously wealthy. But he is saying to that rich man, you better not trust in your wealth, right? Because it can't get you to heaven. Nothing can. Now, the poor man would have less of a tendency to depend upon the riches and material things because he doesn't have any, but the rich man would have much more of a tendency to put his trust, his happiness, his focus, his energy, his affections on material things because he has many. Philippians 3, 7 and 8 says this, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. To gain Christ, you let go of everything else. Nothing is of value compared to Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, Paul said, and count them as but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. For the rich man, for the wealthy woman, when you gain Christ, everything else that you own in comparison is worthless. It is of no account. It is humble. It is of lowly estate. It is poverty compared to knowing Christ. And that is what the rich man must understand. So he can glory or boast and be glad in the fact that though his earthly riches will pass away suddenly, but like the poor man, he has eternal riches. Look at verse 11, he talks about the, uh, how, this, uh, how things pass away so suddenly. He says, the sun rises on this scorching wind on this flowering grass, and the sun comes up one day, and there's a hot wind that comes along, and there's this grass that flowers, and, a, and it just dries up these flowers, and they just fall off and they're dead. And the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits, as he's pursuing his business dealings, as he is uh, saving his money and investing, he's going to fade away. As quickly as flowers fall off flowering grass. Here today, gone tomorrow. It's life. It's life for all of us. So the earthly riches which, will, which wither and fade away cannot be compared with the heavenly riches. They last forever. They are imperishable. Flowers perish. But the riches of Christ as an heir of Christ being seated with him in heavenly places, imperishable. So here are some lessons before we look at verse 12. First of all, there is no promise to the poor that in this life they will be free of poverty. I have to be honest with you there. Because you might have been saying, but Ben, that doesn't pay the bills. I can't promise to you honestly that the bills will be paid. There are poor believers in our world who are dying at the hands of ISIS. There are poor believers who are dying at the hands of Ebola. There are poor believers who are dying at the hands of poverty and starvation in this world. Do they have the same God as us? Do they have the same promises of prayer? Do they have the same position in Christ, seated with Him in the heavenly places? Are they not heirs of Christ and children of God? Yes, but there is no promise in this life that we will be free of that poverty for any of us. In fact, Jesus even said, the poor you will have with you always. Now, for, for those of us who have some money, that might be an easy out to say, well, there are always going to be poor people, so I don't need to really worry about it. Didn't Jesus say they're always going, to be around, always going to be around? So, whatever. 
we do need to know that Jesus and James, as well as the rest of the Bible, they ne it never tries to solve the problem of income inequality. The poor you'll have with you always. But the principles of the gospel are that those of us, anyone who has means, should help those who have no means, right? Isn't that Christian love? Isn't that showing the love of Christ? Isn't that loving your neighbor as yourself to do what you can to relieve the suffering of others? So we're not off the hook because you'll always have the poor with you. We have a responsibility in the principle of the gospel to help those. It dictates that, that we help others, not that we take the money from the rich and give it to the poor, because if a rich person gives to the poor, it should be out of a heart of gratitude and love and concern and mercy and compassion, not being forced, right? And there should be more of it going on. But there is no promise to the poor. Second lesson is this, that trials are an opportunity to grow in holiness. So live an examined life. What I mean by that is Whenever a trial comes into our life, it should be a time that we get on our knees and we pray and we ask for wisdom. And we say to God, God, what's sin? What is it that you are highlighting in my life? Where have I failed? Is, is this of my own doing? Or is this a sovereign kindness, a severe mercy in my life to grow me? It, it, some of our trials are self-inflicted, right? And so... If you are someone struggling with money, maybe, you, maybe it's a time to say, have I made mistakes? Have I sinned in the area of finances? Even as a poor person, have I, have I not handled my money properly? Have I bypassed biblical principles? And it is an opportunity for all of us to grow, whether we are poor or whether we are rich. The next lesson is this. Wealth is a hindrance to spirituality. Uh, that is found throughout the scriptures. I mean, you, uh, I ran out of, of uh, I, I, this morning I, I had to pare down all the verses that I was going to show because there are so many verses in the Bible that talk about how wealth is a hindrance to spirituality. It can trip you up. More than poverty. We are wealthy compared to the rest of the world. I ask who's poor, who's rich. Compared to the rest of the world, we are rich. Everybody in this room. I mean, comparatively speaking, in our nation, yeah, there's comparative wealth. I was at a website um, where you can, you can put in how much money you make and it sh will show you where you rank in the percentage-wise with the rest of the world. If you make minimum wage in the state of Washington, minimum wage, and you, for some reason, have a full-time job making minimum wage, you are in the top 5% of wealth in the world. Everyone in this room, wealth is a hindrance to our spirituality. We say, oh, those poor people in Africa facing Ebola who have hardly anything, who make $2 a week. They may be more holy than us. They may be more happy than us. They may be more content than us because they don't have to worry about all that we worry about. You know what? In our, in our culture, we get as Christians, we get so upset with immorality. I mean, our world is so sensualized and sexualized, and we, we rail against gay marriage and homosexuality, and, and rightly show, so we should, we should frame those things properly, biblically. But what we struggle with in this world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. It's not just the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes is materialism. And our world, our, our culture in America is just as drenched with materialism as it is with sensuality. Isn't it? Go home and watch commercials today. 
we have made a God out of money and investing in portfolios. And it's important to take care of your money and to invest and to, to plan for the future. The scripture says that you should leave an inheritance to your children's children. But if that is the focus of our heart and our affections and our life, it is a God. And materialism is as much of a God in our lives as is sensuality. And we must be careful of it. The lust of the eyes is materialism. Poverty and riches both have unique temptations. That's our next lesson. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9 says, Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Relatively speaking, if you don't have a lot of money in our society, or if you have a lot, there are unique temptations. For the poor person, there is the temptation to steal. There's a temptation to lie, to cheat, to, 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 to put your money at risk uh, in, a, in an improper way. There is that temptation to uh, call into question the goodness of God. He's not providing my needs. I'm out of here. And for the rich person, there's the temptation to, to lay all of their hope in this life that's going to pass away. All of their hope and affections in their riches that's going to fade away. And that is a temptation for each and every one of us because all of our homes and computers and laptops and tablets and cell phones and uh, cars and, and even our portfolio and the gold you put away, it's going away. Every bit of it, one day, gone, completely. All that's left is you and Christ and your heart and what you've done for him in this life because none of the rest of it will matter. You can use your money for that to build the kingdom of God, yes, but it in itself is going away. But there are unique temptations and all of us need to recognize what the temptation is in our life. When we are full, it's easy to say, who is Lord? You know, I mentioned last week when we were in seminary, um, we struggled financially, and I guess by the world's U.S. standards, we were poor for a time. And yet, we've talked about this over the years. The more, you know, as we've gone along, it, this happens. You get older, and, and uh, you, 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 you finish your education, and, and your income goes up and up and up. And we have noticed that the more money we make, the harder it is to trust in God. Right, honey? The more money we make, the harder it is to trust in God. Yes, we've had to trust Him in other areas with our children and with ministry and all these different things. But when it comes to that area, it's easy to say, well, how much is in the account? I'll just use my card. How much, how much do we have in savings? Instead of saying, Lord... Would you provide for this need? We've talked about that many times, how we used to pray for socks. And now we just go buy them. Which is a better place to be in? So poverty and riches both have unique temptations. So the poor and the rich, you see, they're not all that different, are they? So in verse 12 then, he talks to both where he says this, when enduring trials, in verse 12, take hope in the promise of life eternal. He says in verse 12, blessed is a man, and this would be either one of the men, are you a poor man enduring in trial, or are you a rich man or woman enduring in trial? Excuse me, you are blessed. You can take hope in the promise of life internal, eternal. He says, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Those who love him means is the same as saying those who know him, those who believe in him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
He also said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. We don't earn salvation. It's promised to those who love him. So he's not saying, blessed is the one who perseveres, because if you, if you get this thing right the rest of your life, God's going to reward you with salvation. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying perseverance in faith is the evidence of your relationship with him. It's the evidence that you love him. It's the evidence that you know him. That's why you persevere, because you are his. And you are his child, and you will persevere, and you will endure, because the Lord loves you, and you love him, and he will give you all that you need. I want you to notice that he says, for once he has been approved, that one little clause in there, that's your life, and that one little clause, once you've been approved, it's your life. You're going, enduring trials as a rich person, as a poor person, you're considering it all joy, that's what it's all about, you will persevere, you will suffer in the Lord, but once you have been approved, that is your whole life in that one sentence, you are being approved, you are being tested, your faith is coming forth as gold, and it's all in that one phrase, once you have been approved. And once you have been approved, at the end of that approving process, he gives you the crown, which is life. The crown is eternal life. So, some final thoughts here. In Christ, rich and poor alike are equal. Proverbs 22, 2 says this, the rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. You have the same maker as those people you pity. You have the same maker of those people that you despise, who uh, you say are part of, one may say are part of the 1%, and they're, you know, they, they despise poor people. We have the same maker. But how much more is this true for believers in Christ? We come from the same place, dead in our trespasses and sins. We have the same Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved in the same manner by grace and raised up with Him. We have the same blessings. We are seated with Him at the right hand of the Father, and we have the same future, a crown of life. We're all in the same boat, poor and rich alike. And Christ is the supreme example to us. In this life, he had nothing. He had no home. He was despised. He was rejected. He was a man who was thought of as a Galilean son of a carpenter. He was given no earthly praise. But in his human experience, he can identify with poor people. But he also identifies with the rich. Because he existed with his father for all eternity, and he humbled himself, and he laid aside that glory, his rich, all of his riches, he laid it aside, he counted it as nothing to become one of us and humble himself, to become a man and to die on a cross. He gave up his high position, and he became poor, and he possessed all things, but he possessed nothing being this man on earth. He can actually probably identify with the rich even better, can't he? Because he gave it up. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's our salvation in Christ, isn't it? This morning, we are going to have the Lord's Supper. And what a great opportunity to talk about poverty and riches and what Christ has done. How do we approach the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Is it because we have money and position and power and and a name and fame? Is that how we are accepted? 
or do we humble ourselves, whether you're poor or rich, as Christ humbled himself? And when we partake of the bread and we partake of the cup, what are we re remembering? We're remembering that God the Son existed in all of eternity and he put on the form of a bondservant, of a slave. He became a human being, a worm, as it were, to be one of us that we might share in his riches. And as we partake of the Lord's table this morning, we, we are saying his body was broken because he became a, a human being and his blood was shed. He gave out his very life that we might have eternal life. And we have that because of his gracious love for us. If you are here this morning, believer in Christ, this is a family meal and we invite you to take part in it. And as the, the bread and the cup are passed, would you just hold on to it and contemplate that richness of this king of kings who, who became poor for you, that you might become rich in him. Once everyone is served, we will partake of it together as a family, and we will give him praise for what he has done. Father, thank you for the blood of Christ, the life of Christ, we thank you for his humility and laying aside all of the riches in heaven for a time that he would become one of us, that we might be partakers of what he has and his riches. We take of this bread and this cup now with those things in mind that we might live as children, as heirs of the living Christ.